Greetings, this is Eugene the Philosopher, the greatest living philosopher after the unfortunate passing of Quentin Robert de Nameland, who has been the greatest living philosopher before me. In this video, we continue our venture into the onion of aliens, as I call it, so we'll try to peel off a couple of more layers to see what's going on inside of it, alright? Now, if you remember, in the previous video, I talked about fundamental interactions. So, the question is, that I'm asking right now, is it the, the whole concept of fundamental interactions, is it like all too human also, uh, in Nietzschean terms? Uh, and I would say that the problem we might encounter here is the failure of the, con of, of the, of the whole notion of the concept of subject in philosophical sense. Uh, and uh, you might remember in my videos about libertarianism, in my videos about mythology, I already mentioned that, that problem, the downfall of the classical philosophy of subject, so to speak. Uh, and we can even see that in politics, I gave some examples with like abortions, the, ch the rights of children and things like that, um, and genetic modifications. So why is it relevant here? Why, why, why would we talk about subject in the video about aliens and in particular in this segment where I talk about fundamental interactions. Uh, and I would say that it's because the very concept of, well, you know, what is fundamental interaction is uh, we have some particles that have some interactions in between them and voila. So uh, the concept of a particle in the first place, I believe, is basically a consequence of, of human uh, self-perception, if you like. So, uh, and this is actually not my idea, it's an idea uh, of all people, of Karl Marx, uh, but also Nietzsche uh, talked about that at some point, but uh, Karl Marx actually has a pretty decent analysis in his PhD thesis of, um, it's called about the difference between the uh, atomistic philosophy of uh, Democritus and uh, Epi Epicurus uh, or something like that. Uh, so uh, in part two, I mean, I'm not I'm not a fan of Marx, but this this work was was worth it. I mean, it's it's worth a read. His PhD thesis. It was before he encountered Engels and became a, uh, a British spy. You know, wink wink. Uh, it was in his Anakin stage, so to speak. So he was a pretty decent, uh, aspiring young philosopher back then. So, uh, in part two, chapter four of this PhD thesis, he, uh, makes this notion, he kind of expresses this idea, which is again, sometime later, repeat, was repeated by Nietzsche. I'm not sure if he read Marx or it was kind of his own idea, but nevertheless, uh, that, uh, basically the atom in, in the classical sense of the word, so something indivisible, is only like a mirror of our own concept of ourselves as something indivisible, you know, individuum, some, some solid entity that cannot be separated, uh, I mean, cannot be taken apart, etc. Uh, and I think it's a pretty logical idea. Uh, I don't think you can arrive at the concept of immortal soul, let's say, if you don't perceive yourself as a unity, as something, well, almost like by definition, a soul is, is like something that has no parts. It's some being in, in itself, etc. So, and it also should be constant. It also should be equal to itself in all the moments in time, right? So it cannot change. So it has this sort of fundamental ontology behind it, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it is um, through our perceptions of our body mostly that we arrive at this concept, I believe. Like our limbs, they mo more or less behave like solid bodies, you know. And solid bodies don't change, they're equal to themselves all the time. Uh, but if you had an ability to perceive your own life in like fast forward type of way, like compress all of your life in one minute and, and watch that video, you would definitely not arrive at a concept of, you know, something indivisible and something uh, constant, right? It would be just a terrible mess of, of, of impressions and feelings and whatever, really horrible ones, really good ones, etc. And like, uh, you wouldn't perceive yourself as, a, as this unit of being, right? So 
in in a lot of ways it's an illusion and we actually through some thinking we can perceive that as an illusion right uh, i mean the 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 the, the idea of, of a soul of a subject etc so anyways atoms are just our projection of this same idea into the external world so we try to fill it with like copies of our of ourselves so to speak and yeah basically this is the idea so that's why this downfall of subject also matter for cognition for you know models of the world for the idea of fundamental interactions even uh, and are there any alternatives to this idea uh, of particles of atoms etc and i would say that we should consider two philosophies here uh, the one is uh, descartes uh, the one philosopher and the other is again already mentioned democritus uh, so descartes was telling that was saying that we have two different radically different types of being in the universe one is what he, what he called res cogitans uh, like cognitive thing which is the soul this I don't know, some fundamental entity, indivisible, etc. And, and the other one is res extensa, which means that extended thing, the thing has, that which has size. Uh, okay. So, and, and like our body, according to Descartes, is res extensa because it has size, it can be measured, it can be separated, etc., etc. Uh, whereas res cogitans is our soul. It's sort of like attached to our body somewhere. But it, it's not really of the physical world. That's that's basically his idea. But physical world is about res extensa. It's about the, the, those things. Uh, but in philosophy of Democritus, he, he literally said, there are only atoms and emptiness. And everything is made of atoms and emptiness, right? So atoms is exactly this res cogitans of Descartes. It's this indivisible unit of being. Whereas... Emptiness, in Democritus' terms, is exactly the res extensa of, of Descartes. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's kind of... Uh, well, okay, anyway, l l l let's, let, let's proceed from here. So, what if we don't start... I've already discussed this atoms... Uh, slash res cogitans uh, issue, but what if we start from this other thing, the emptiness uh, uh, that Democritus is talking about, or res extensa that Descartes is talking about. So, uh, this is definitely a different perception of the world, right? We, we have this uh, other fundamental idea of, of extensive things, of, of empty things, of vast spaces, you know, etc. So, uh, we might and we actually have those perceptions of, of those things again air water you know any continuous medium uh, we, we know that from experience so we have a pretty good idea of what it is right and so it, it, you can arrive at various pictures of the world following from that idea rather than from atomic idea and particle idea like for example you can say that well, we have this ether, you know, that kind of fills everything like water or air, and it might be condensed here and there, and you'll, you'll get those clumps that we, we actually then interpret as atoms, right, etc., or any other type of particles. Uh, and this is another, like, genuine, uh, viable physical approach to the world, right? And, uh, again, I can name all those ether theories, including the, like the modern revival of ether theories, uh, they actually never really died. Uh, and then, then there are pretty curious examples of this, this approach, like uh, Paul Laviolette, uh, or La Violet, uh, a modern thinker, has this idea of uh, subquantum kinetics, what he calls, where basically he has two or, or even more separate ethers kind of also filling all of the space but particles he interprets he interprets particles as basically places where one ether is kind of flowing into another so it, they are the places where some sort of chemical reaction between those two ethers takes place etc etc so there, there are many variations of the the same idea 
but I hope you can see that it's really a viable alternative to this approach of just particles as you know solid balls of being so to speak this in in a, in a way it's it's a Newtonian approach I mean Newton ex exploited the same Democritus approach etc etc so uh, and for example quantum mechanics uh, kind of tries to unite those two uh, it has actually uh, I mean it this attempt wasn't successful, uh, if you want my opinion. So uh, they have particles, you know, atoms in Democritus terms, and they also have waves, emptiness in Democritus terms. Uh, and they arrive at this idea of dualism, again, trying, trying to just stick the two together to see if they, you know, would somehow meld into some th singular unity, which doesn't happen, obviously. Uh, so there's still this problem of wave particle dualism like uh, what is reality the question still remains i mean according to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory uh, tries a little bit uh, a little different approach uh, it states that but it also tries to unite the both of the ideas it states that well more or less emptiness is the main thing but uh, quantum fields i mean so they kind of fill all of the space it's just that in some points those fields are excited so they have some extra energy and that's where we have particles right and these particles might propagate kind of like a wave on the surface of the ocean through the the, the quantum field etc but really i mean quantum field is, is the same as ether i mean the, there's no doubt about it it's the same idea uh uh, and, and, and if the field is not excited, then we have vacuum, which is like genuine emptiness. But still, the whole idea of a quantum field, it's the same old idea of uh, Democritus of emptiness or Descartes of uh, res extensa, etc. So, these two approaches of res cogitans and res extensa, or atoms and emptiness, uh, they seem to be uh, really inherent to uh, humans kind of perception of the world i don't really think there like any alternatives are possible like it, it seems to be the only way people have so far i mean the only two ways that people have come up with in in terms of describing the world uh, and i just would like you to appreciate this uh complexity of culture how the very same ideas that we might find in descartes and even earlier in Democritus, they kind of resurface here and there and, and people kind of think, oh, I've invented something new, whereas they utilize the very same cognitive processes, the very same sets of ideas. It's just that maybe they call them differently, like ether or, or quantum field, but, but it, it really is the same, like ideologically and conceptually, it's the same thing that uh, the ancient Greeks were talking about, the, the, the French philosophers were talking about, etc. So it's really very fascinating to me, at least, to explore all those things and those relations. Um, it just goes to show that ideas don't die, you know. It's, the, 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 it's one of the interesting properties of culture, uh, and it's pretty fascinating. So... <clears throat> Uh, at some point uh, previously, I mentioned the idea that particles are actually might be alive, right? Uh, and since I've already mentioned that the very idea of a particle is really our own projection of our perception of ourselves into the world, like we try to recognize in the world the same beings as we, we ourselves per perceive ourselves, right? So atoms, hence atoms appear. So it's not really surprising, right? And uh, uh, we, we, we do the same trick with people, with animals, with plants, with any objects. Again, as I've elucidated in my, in my video about mythology, we construct those entities. We kind of condense them into a single being. That's how an object is made. Uh, it's, it's the sum of perceptions kind of archived in, in a single entity. So it helps us to organize our perceptions in a very effective way. Uh, but, uh, well, some, some might say, well, just forget about all that, forget about your own definition of life, which I'm, I probably am going to remind you right now because I'm, I'm going to use it later, is that I'm, my definition of life is that it's uh, anything that uh, repeats itself in time and multiplies in space. 
any process. So this is my definition of life. But anyway, so uh, naively one could say, well, it's very easy. Like if something moves on its own, then it's alive. If it doesn't move on its own, then it's not alive. It's inanimate matter. Uh, but unfortunately, this naive approach fails. And again, in the very same quantum mechanics, as I've mentioned in my previous video, uh, we have this Heisenberg's uncertainty, uh, where we don't really know where the particle is and where it's going. And we cannot know. I mean, it's, it's principle, uh, it's a principle, uh, um, uh, like a, I don't know, boundary, or how do you say, it? like, um, constraint on, on the whole quantum mechanical description. So uh, it's almost like postulated that we cannot know where, it, where it's going. And, and on some level, of course, you can say, well, it's because of free will. So particles might actually be perceived as alive, right? And this whole, uh, well, okay, that, that, that would be another digression, which I don't really want here. Uh, uh, and and again, Epicurus also had this idea in his atomism, uh, a little bit after Democritus, but uh, not much, that that idea of de deviation of an atom from a straight line. So he had this idea that, you know, there is something sort of like wrong about atoms. They're not really mechanical, you know, uh, which I would say corresponds really well to this Heisenberg's uncertainty. So again, it's this really, really fascinating uh, inheritance of ideas, if you like. So you can recognize the very same patterns of thinking, even like removed thousands of years apart, or well, at least hundreds of years apart. I mean, depending on what type of chronology you prefer. Uh, but okay, uh, so uh, really this illusion or maybe whatever, this perception of particles as being alive, it's really the price we pay for that, the whole concept of particle. Since we construct the particle in the same way we construct all other objects, like actors, you know, again, I refer to my video about mythology, uh, yeah, it's no wonder that sometimes they appear to be alive because, well, they're actors, they're doing something, etc., etc. So by filling the world with the shadows of our own, shadows of ourselves, I mean, we we kind of have to acknowledge that, yeah, well, we're, we're kind of alive, maybe they're, they're also alive, etc., etc. So, uh, and by the way, there's another thing that I've kind of missed uh, in my previous video, uh, where I, I told you that, well, actually particles, uh, they're kind of not alive, right? B because, well, they repeat in space, but they don't seem to multiply. But then I thought about it, like, literally today, before this recording of this video, and I thought that, well, actually, if you look at electrons, for example, they do multiply. Uh, what they need is some energy to do that. If you, if you take a proton, an electron, with high energy with respect to this proton, like, let's say, one mega electron volt, or a little bit more than that, but close to that, a little bit more. Uh, so, the electron might actually uh, emit a gamma ray that would turn into another electron and a positron uh, in the field of this proton. So, electron, in a way, have multiplied itself. Right. Of course, there's the whole issue of antimatter and like why are there po positrons, etc. But there is genuinely another electron being born from this process. So yeah, it's it's a, an interesting subject. Maybe they actually do multiply, and maybe they actually are genuinely alive in this sense. Right. What they need is a little bit of energy, but that's that's normal. That's how living beings behave. They need energy and matter to reproduce. Right. So it's an interesting question, I believe. But uh, anyway, isn't it strange that we have only like 17 fundamental particles according to standard model? 
uh, or about, so I'm not sure. So why is the universe so simple in a way? Uh, because it had like infinite possibilities to, to, to be infinitely complex. So why, why are there only so much of those particles, uh, etc.? And I think it, it is due to, to uh, us filt filtering our own perceptions or rather our own makeup uh, only making certain types of perceptions possible. So we, we tend to simplify the world first and foremost and, and like we tend to even ignore some of our own perceptions, right? But at the same time, even our own perceptions are not complete in the first place, right? So if we had a different physiology, a different whatever, uh, maybe we would perceive the world differently and maybe we would have different perceptions. Uh, that's what I'm saying. And, and thus, since we construct all these objects, including particles, we would have a different uh, pantheon of, of elementary particles uh, and not, not those 17. That's what I'm saying. And uh, in a way, you can sort of uh, wear the anthropic principle inside out here and you can say that mm, uh, the world well anthropic principle basically states well there are actually two versions of it there is a tautological weak version and there's a more strong strong version <coughs> <coughs> so the weak version states that the world it is like how it is only because if it was different, uh, we wouldn't exist. Okay, so since we exist, then the world should be as it is, right? And this is absolutely tautological, as you might see. Uh, it's, it, it basically says, we are a part of the world, so if, if the world was different, we would be different, right? And it's a tautology. Uh, but there is a stronger per, uh, anthropic principle which states, the world is as it is, for us to be as we are like there was a like a reason you know it was like uh, set in stone that it should be like that so that those stupid humans would exist in in this exact form right uh which sounds just stupid in my opinion but anyway so i'm talking about this tautological weaker part so you can sort of wear it um inside out and 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 say that uh, uh the world uh is the way we know it exactly because we are how we are, right? Not for us to be how we are, but since we are like that, the world should be like that, right? Because if the world was different, we would be different. That's what I'm saying, essentially. Uh, and and, and in, in, that, in that way, entropic principle would still be viable because we would be different and the world would be different. And we would still say that, wait a minute, the world is like that and we are like that and we are part of the world. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. so, so it, it, it's really a tautology. It doesn't have any, any meaning, really, any, any positive message to it. Uh, so anyways... Uh, I'm, I'm kind of stuck here a little bit. So, yeah, anthropic principle is a tautology, as I said, at least the weaker part of it, like Darwinism, like Darwinian principle, but that, that, uh, I refer to my previous video for this. Uh, so there's really no problem here. I mean, with our perception of, of that type of fundamental interactions, of that quantity of them, etc. Uh, but, um, I think in Stanislav Lem, maybe it was someone else, but I think it, it, it's not my idea. But what if there is actually an, a genuine, like, evolution of elementary particles? Uh, and, and this type of arrangement that we observe, we observe it exactly because it was, it was, it evolved that way, you know, it's, it's some sort of, stable effective arrangement that kind of makes things work uh, in v very vague terms again not implying some uh, reason behind all that not not implying some uh, intent or design you know just saying that well it just kind of chaotically evolved into something like this um, because it was more or less stable and uh, 
why not? Uh, I don't see any problems with that type of idea. And again, particles might be alive according to that approach, I believe. <clears throat> and another argument for perceiving particles as alive would be uh, the relative, uh, r relatively recent, actually, advent of the idea of inanimate nature. So, nature started being perceived as inanimate only a couple of hundred years ago, like literally 300 years ago, maybe. This uh, metaphor of clock, the clock metaphor, uh, was uh, coined by Thomas Hobbes, a thinker of 17th century. Uh, and again, if you recall my video about the nature of knowledge, there I kind of briefly give this history of thought in this regard, how previously before that, uh, nature was basically filled with spirits and demons. It was all animated, right? Only since 17th century, since the beginning of uh, modernity, uh, we've had this concept of inanimate nature. And we kind of uh, juxtaposed, kind of uh, put ourselves outside of it and perceived ourselves as, as animate, and nature as inanimate, you know, as a mechanism, basically. So it's it's a very recent concept, and and yeah. So uh, I'm 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 uh, trying to make a point that particles, like in some way, as we're already exiting this modernity, we might try to actually perceive particles as alive, as as would be more fitting to this pre-modern stage, maybe, at least in philosophical sense. Uh, so, uh, yeah, okay, and, and even, uh, there are some examples even, well, basically, only in like 19th century, this idyllic approach to nature uh, has, beca has become a thing. You know, basically in Romanticism, wh where they've had all those, you know, happy shepherds, uh, you know, playing in the fields and being, like, super delighted. Uh, whereas before that, like in 17th century, nature was actually per perceived as, as something horrible and dangerous, which was the case. So it was filled with stuff that wants to kill you and you know, all those w w destructive weather phenomena and, and famines and, uh, you know, bad harvest and, and floods and wars and, and stuff. So the world was really a different place back then. But in 19th century, when people started actually accumulating more and more power, then it was that the nature actually turned into this lifeless mechanism, basically, and all that folklore started, uh, you know, Victorian England, that, 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 that's like, like a uh, typical example of, of that idyllic approach to nature, uh, where, you know, the, the, the horrible streets of London versus, you know, happy shepherds somewhere in, in the hills, uh, etc. And um, I, I kind of want to start another discussion here, but I'll give I'll, I'll give one example uh, here previously before I started. Uh, so Descartes, in his um, since I've already mentioned him in his uh, uh, Les Passions de l'âme, uh, he actually talks the, the the passions of the soul. He actually talks about spirits rather than particles. So. Again, like in the middle of the 17th century, people actually kind of talked about, still talked about spirits rather than something mechanistical, you know. And it's, again, not, not very frequently acknowledged. Uh, so eventually, that way or another, this environment, nature, it turned into something inanimate, in, into this entropic sink, so to speak. So we are ordered, you know, and we have our sub subjectivity, but the nature is kind of this in entropic thing that kind of, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's an entropic sink for us. We, we utilize it as an object, right? And we are subjects, obviously, in this uh, approach. So, uh, but the reverse processes uh, 
Uh, and again, it, it all happened because of industri industrialization, because humanity actually accumulated a lot of power. Uh, because previously it was the reverse. The nature was this big guy who was abusing us, humanity, and we were like entropic sink for it. Right? It's kind of like, you know, a, a, a kid growing up and, and father kind of beats him constantly. So a father is this subject and then and the kid is just an object. He cannot do anything about it. But we, when he grows up and his father is very old, then he can beat the shit out of his father, right? So he becomes the subject and the father becomes this object. So, so, so the story was like that with humanity and nature, more or less. Um, so, uh, and in society, actually, the reverse thing happened. So there were some classes of people or individual people who were considered inanimate almost, you know, like entropic sinks, so to speak, uh, the tools. Uh, think about the untouchables in India or slaves all across the world, pretty much, or women, right? They weren't allowed to do anything, more or less. So... But the, 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 the very same process of accumulation of power by society, industrialization, uh, it, it, uh, eventually got rid of all that, right? So slavery, which initially appeared as a really effective tool of agricultural civilization to accumulate wealth, because, well, the product, productivity was really low, the uh, population was low, so the people were really poor. I mean, the division of labor sucked, really, uh, etc. So labor was really a natural resource by that time, because you needed to work in the fields, etc. Uh, so slavery was a big thing. And slavery was only abolished when industrialization really kicked in, like in the middle of 19th century, again, think of, uh, well, not sure about the, like, civilized world, I mean, Europe, but in, in, like, the frontier of the civilized world, which, which was Russia and United, Sa United States, uh, slavery was only abolished in the 60s, right? In 1861, I think I already mentioned that, but I don't remember. In 18, 1861, it was abolished in Russia, serfdom, I mean. In 1863, slavery was abolished in the U.S. Uh, so, yeah. And that was like when industrialization really kicked in. So, I mean, a little bit before that, uh, it did. Uh, yeah, I'm come, I'm kind of, kind of got lost here. Uh, yeah, and, and when we've accumulated enough resources to make work comfortable, we've also allowed women to work, right? So women never worked in coal mines, they never went to war, etc. Only when it, we, we've had enough resources to allow uh, those people that we cherish, which is women, to actually go there and work, right? Uh, and not suffer. Uh, in the same way as men did previously. All right, so let's change the topic a little bit. So, well, I've talked about entropy a lot, right? And there's this Schrodinger's approach to life where he says that life is basically a process of export of entropy, right? Uh, in a way, it's like self-construction, uh, like you consume resources consume matter and you self-organize, you kind of build yourself and, and you export entropy in the form of, uh, you know, waste, basically, like socialism uh, or CO2. You know, the <laughs> it's funny that uh, I just thought about it, that, you know, every artist who depicts hell uh, tends to, and it's kind of a rule, like a, a good tone, you know, to put your enemies in the hell that you're describing, right? So I guess anyone who talks about waste uh, and entropy should mention something that he doesn't like as an example. So there you go. Uh, and uh, so what I was talking about, so yeah, so we have those principles of Spencer, uh, principles of life, of integration, which means consuming resources, differentiation, which means ordering of yourself, and uh, 
well ordering, right? Differentiation means kind of division of labor of different tissues, etc. And getting rid of waste, uh, and uh, thus kind of increasing entropy all around, but decreasing it where you are inside of yourself. Um, so this is Schrodinger's approach to life. But there is also a, a con- constructivist who uh, note another interesting thing, in particular that biosphere or a population as a whole, it actually increases entropy. And uh, I think it was Bruno Latour who came up with this brilliant example. Like imagine a new volcanic island appearing in the ocean, like this Nishinoshima uh, in somewhere south of Japan, like five years ago, I think it appeared. So uh, this new volcanic island is completely barren, right? There's nothing in there. But like literally seconds afterwards, bacteria arrive. Then like, I don't know how much later, but pretty soon, some some of those arthropods arrive or birds or you know plants whatever so life eventually would fill this island whatever kind of life some life you know then some animals would would, would arrive like like I don't know, penguins or whatever uh, seals and uh, uh, so what did happen is the increases in entropy actually the biosphere disorganized itself because when this island appeared, the entropy was lower because it wasn't filled with anything. So there was some ordering, like life is everywhere but there, right? This is a like an ordered spot in life where, you know, I mean in biosphere. Uh, but it filled it, right? And, and so in this way, it, it, it disorganized itself. It, 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 uh, the entropy has risen, I mean, of the whole thing. So Schrodinger's approach obviously doesn't work here uh, on the populational level again. And it's important to note. Uh, and uh, But I think that it's actually the uh, consequence of this multiplication of space that I talked about. This uh, intent to expand as far as possible, conquer everything, will to power, if you like, in Nietzschean terms, uh, again, in my definition of life, life is anything that repeats itself in time and multiplies in space. So this multiplication in space is exactly what causes populational level rise in entropy uh, in uh, in life. Uh, and, uh, well, we have other examples like, you know, spreading of infections or cancer cells or zerg creep, you know, uh, and or... So this is basically like a comic book version of the of the same process, which is really easy to understand. Or we have things like Colorado beetle, you know, spreading in the U.S. in 19th century and then in 20th century, uh, uh, being introduced to Europe and wreaking havoc. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, living in Belarus in potato-dominated country, you know, Colorado Colorado beetle is a, is a big thing. Uh, but anyway, so we have those uh, two things. Uh, Schrodinger's thing, where he says that individuum lowers entropy, which I explain through my definition of life. It's because he needs to repeat it uh, in time, right? Uh, to stay alive, essentially. And, uh, well, genetic code needs to be kept intact for everything to repeat as, as it should repeat, right? So, thus, lower entropy is required for an individual organism. But on a populational level, we see the reverse process. Uh, the entropy increases. And that's because of the second part of my definition, because we need to multiply in space. That's what life is all about. Well, one half of what it's all about. Therefore, the entropy increases. It kind of disorganizes itself, it tries to spread out. Uh, and so, yeah, my definition more or less explains all those properties, I would say. Not like explains, it contains them, rather. Um, and uh, you can say, in some sense, that uh, life actually behaves like a gas, you know. It's, it's 
I mean, on a populational level. It's, it's a gas that tries to take up all the, the available space, right? So it's a pretty interesting analogy. So let's talk about stars again. I've already mentioned them in, in my previous video, and I've already mentioned that they actually lower their entropy. You know, they fuse lighter elements into more complex, heavier ones. They uh, sustain their structure like this. They actually violate the second principle of thermodynamics. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, they increase entropy all around. So they export it, right, in the form of emission, like black body spectrum is the most chaotic type of emission you can imagine, highest entropy, uh, and, and at the same time, you know, electrons and protons, just a terrible mess of these simplest particles possible, I mean, the solar wind. Um, so, yeah, they kind of look like they're alive. Uh, so if some ecological zombie activist would ever bite you, you know, those repentive types, I'm re referring to my own video, repentive thinking, um, and you would also turn into ecological zombie activist, uh, you might say that we're just, you know, like dung beetles swimming in the crap of our star, basically, you know, in the waste of this, this higher life form. Which kind of makes me think about Egypt, you know, they, uh, they also worship the sun and they worship the dung beetles, the scarabs. Maybe there is something to it. Uh, but anyway, so, and if you think about the hypotheses like the stellar metamorphosis by Jeffrey Volinsky, who says that uh, essentially planets are just stars that kind of burned out and it's only their core that's remaining. Well, it turns out that we would be just bugs on a dead body of our son's friend or something like that, or father maybe even, you know, uh, because it's all older than the son, so it might be a father, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so let's talk about the connection of entropy with the arrow of time for a little bit. I would say that it's caused by the individual perception of time uh, and and themselves, the individual. Uh, because time goes on, I would claim, to the extent that you actually lower your own entropy. So as, as much as you self-organize, the slower actually the time goes. Or maybe faster. Let me think about it. Yeah, slower, definitely, for you, the more you self-organize. So, in some sense, an individuum kind of falls out of the world, you know, kind of uh, falls through the textures, so to speak, uh, of the world. And he's being, like, swept, washed to the shore of this river of time, we might say. And, and thus, as he's on this solid shore... He can observe the flow of this time, of this river of time around him, right? So this is what happens as the entropy inside decreases. And uh, esoterically speaking, I would say that inanimate matter, this world around us, is, is like a liquid time. So it continues to flow. Whereas animate matter, such as ourselves, is, is like a solid time. It's like a crystal of time, if you like. Because again, solids, they're equal to themselves, so they're kind of stationary in, in time, right? Whereas liquid time is everything else that kind of just blah, 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 chaotically rolls. Uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, but, but that's on the individual level, but for life in general, like populational level or biospherical level, I would actually claim that time doesn't even exist. Uh, in some sense. Again, life is, is like a gas. It's, it's very inertial and unconscious, unconscious, you might say. And in this sense, also, you might claim that life actually could have existed eternally. Uh, since, again, by my definition, life is a repetition in time and multiplication in space. So, how can you have a repetition in 
where, where you have a starting point. Like there's nothing to repeat before the starting point, right? So we have to get rid of that. Like repetition should go on forever, at least backwards. Uh, and, uh, I have the same thoughts about the universe in general. I'll, I'll make it specifically another video about cosmology, but so far I'll just mention that causality, which is the, the base of, of any science, physics in particular, with, with all the conservation laws, uh, without causality, you don't have any conservation laws. You can't even use e equations, right? Because equation means something conserved, something in this moment equal to something in that moment. And if there's nothing, no, you know, quantities like that, you cannot use equations, right? So causality requires an eternal universe because everything should have a reason and it blah, blah, blah goes on forever. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I remember that I saw an interesting article about the so-called Moore's Law, uh, uh, M-O-O-R-E Law, uh, which, well, the usual Moore's Law is about transistors and the quantity of transistors in, in integrated circuits. So it basically says that every two years, or roughly about so, the number of transistors in an integrated typical integrated circuit doubles. That's what it says. So it's a, like a logarithmic law of, of increase uh, of this number. But somebody, uh, I don't remember the name of the guy, but the article was named uh, Life Before Earth. It's 2013. You can find it. It's available on archive.org. Uh, so the author applied this law to genes, uh, to genetic code, and he found that if you start from two nucleotides, uh, which is like supposedly the beginning of life, uh, then the, and, and you kind of integrate all the paleogenetic data, you would arrive at, at, the, at a law that states that this pair of nucleotides existed like nine billion years ago or about so for it to progress in, in a Moore's Law type of way to what we observe today. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty interesting because, again, according to Big Bang hypothesis, which violates all the laws of physics, uh, Earth is like maybe four or five billion years old, so life should be like to twice as old as Earth, again, if you start from Big Bang hypothesis, which I don't, but anyway. Uh, in this framework, it seems like it proves the hypothesis of panspermia, you know, that life arrived on Earth from somewhere else. Uh, but that way or another, I mean, I have a big problem with, with the hypothesis in the first place because it doesn't answer where the life comes from, right? This is more or less the question I'm dealing with right now. Uh, it just says that, well, life came from somewhere else. But how did it get to somewhere else? Like, how did it form there? It never, never deals with that question. So it's not really an answer, I would say. This is my point. So I would say that uh, we should firstly ask whether there is a beginning of life in the first place. You know, in mathematical terms, uh, to prove the existence theorem. Because if you don't do that, and ex examples are numerous in mathematics also, that if you don't prove the existence theorem, you can prove a lot of stupid stuff. Like, you can prove that one is the biggest prime number, for example. Uh, because you haven't proven that a biggest prime number exists. Such a proof doesn't exist so far. Uh, but if you just assume it does, you might prove that one is the biggest prime number, which is obviously not the case. So you have to be careful about that, about asking those types of questions, like where is the beginning of life? You should firstly prove that there was a beginning of life. And I have seen such a proof and I'm, I'm, I don't know, I have heavy doubts that it exists and it might be somebody might come up with such, such a proof. Uh, because again, if you look at my definition, which might sound arrogant, but I found the best, uh, there should be no beginning of life. So, and in a way, this, again, kind of returning to the analogy of the problem of beginning of life and the beginning of universe, I believe this 
kind of way of extrapolating things backwards, like the complexity of genetic code, or let's say the redshift in cosmology, like we're saying, well, okay, everything is like, well, firstly, we interpret every redshift as Doppler redshift, which is not, not proven at all that this is the case. Uh, and then we say, well, it seems like everything collects into a point, like sometime down the line backwards, right? And I think that th this is the same fallacy as, as with this article with Moore's law that tries to extrapolate the genetic complexity backwards. Uh, and arrives at some finite point uh, in the past as the beginning of life. And the same is done by Big Bang cosmology that extrapolates this whatever redshift backwards in time and arrives at the, the moment of the Big Bang, uh, which both of which I would say contradict basic logic. But anyway, I'm very confident that Big Bang never happened. I'm not sure the beginning of life never happened. That, that's what I'm saying. But there is a clear analogy in both of those things, I would say. Uh, all right, so, well, somebody might ask a question. Well, there's another vicious circle here, uh, because I'm trying to define life through space and time, but at the same time, I'm trying to define time uh, and space through life, right? In some sense, at least I've tried it with time. Uh, but yeah, and this uh, known problem, uh, Gödel's uh, theorem proves that, uh, or rather the proof of the theorem proves that, yeah, sometimes it's inevitable. Like, you cannot have a self-contained semiotic system, you know, symbolic system that would describe everything. It's just impossible. So, Sometimes you have to make those compromises and define several objects at once, like I'm d doing with, with life, space, and time, well, more or less here. Uh, and, and it was a thing that Poincaré had been complaining about, that in mathematics, even the basic objects are not defined explicitly. You can only implicitly define, as for example, Hilbert does, uh, two points on a line, right? you can draw a line through two points. This is a definition for both a point and a line. But other than that, <laughs> there's no way to define neither of them, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah. Uh, and at the same time, I'm using... It's kind of a minute of self-criticism. At the same time, I'm using the entropy, whereas the concept of entropy, where, whereas I haven't even defined it at all, right? And I'm kind of vaguely re referencing the second principle of thermodynamics, which is also, which is also cannot be proven because it rests on ergodic hypothesis, which cannot be proven, etc. So I'm using the whole bunch of unprovable axioms, which might not even be applicable here. Uh, but I'm just doing that to at least give you some intuitive understanding of what I'm talking about. Uh, not, not what genuinely the world is but at least how i perceive it like maybe, maybe you would get some inspiration from that maybe it would spark some ideas on your side who knows that's what i'm doing uh so i won't i wouldn't de de deconstruct also the concept of entropy you know i'm, I'm using it as a tool like a, as a hammer to, to beat the, the, the whole problem with. And, you know, I wouldn't be pleased if the hammer would disintegrate in my, in my hands. Like, I'm, I'm going to be left with nothing in the end. But okay, let's, let's proceed a bit faster, I guess, because it's like 53 minutes already, 54. Like in 10 minutes, the video is going to disappear. But I hope, I hope at least in 25, I would finish. I don't know. There's still a lot of stuff to talk about. So, um, how, are, how universal are uh, all these perceptions that I talked about, about time and space, etc.? Well, since, as I mentioned in the previous video, to perceive aliens as genuine aliens, we need to perceive them as being alive, and therefore, they should also repeat themselves in time and multiply in space, as all the living things do. Uh, so they would also sort of expand, they would also uh, try to, you know, conquer uh, all the neighboring uh, spaces. Uh, 
though kind of their space, the way they understand it, the way they behave in, in the space perceived by us might be completely different. But that's a, another story. Uh, uh, but if we're talking about our space, uh, what size th these aliens might have? Well, completely arbitrary, I would say. Again, a particle might be a living thing, right? As I've described previously. And a star might be a living thing. And th the whole galaxy might be a living thing. So all of that might be aliens in some sense, right? Especially if we're talking about other galaxies like Andromeda uh, or whatever. Uh, and uh, but what is the uh, okay I also wanted to mention this fractality of life here since we're talking about sizes because you know again if we perceive the whole galaxy as being alive well we're also kind of like a part of the galaxy so you know there's this idea that well it's not really an idea it's a reality that we have cells which a lot of cells make up a tissue a lot of tissues make up an, an organism, a lot of organisms make, make up a population, so there, there's, there's this nestedness, this fractality, right? So, yeah, this is definitely a thing, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and um, if we look at the... let's talk about the alien biospheres for a minute. If we look at, at our own biosphere, uh, we have very many species there, right? Or here, rather. Uh, of course, they're related, they have similar genetic code, etc. They have similar non-coding DNA, etc., uh, etc. Et and they sometimes compete, sometimes they eat each other, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, so in general, biosphere is more like a mixture of gases rather than a single gas. That's what I'm saying, I guess. Uh, but I guess we should expect that the same would be true for an alien biosphere. Uh, we should expect at least the same, well, let's say comparable level of diversity there. It would be rather strange if, if alien biosphere would be like super barren with only a couple of species. That would be very strange. Again, due to the uh, property of, of this property of life to multiplicate in space, it would try to fill all those available niches and given enough time um, a lot of stuff would appear. Or maybe a lot of stuff was always there again if you assume that life didn't even start. Maybe all this genetic diversity was existing always or something, I don't know. That, that's a separate debate that I'm not really ready for right now, but the point I'm making is that, yeah, I would say that and I haven't seen that anywhere near in science fiction. Well, for obvious reasons, it's really hard to invent like a million of species. Uh, but the level of diversity that we see on Earth, I, I think we should observe something like that in other uh, alien eco ecosystems, if you like. Uh, and it's rarely acknowledged, I believe, such possibility. So where would aliens live or exist? Uh, well, anywhere. Again, the possibilities are endless. Like, it might be asteroids, comets, planets, interplanetary, intergalactic, uh, you know, interstellar uh, space. It might be galactic cores. It might be galactic jets. Uh, it might be, like, molecular clouds. Uh, it might be... Uh, nebular, I mean, planetary nebulae, it might be surfaces of stars, because why not? Or it might be interiors of stars, uh, interiors of planets, whatever. Why not? Like, I don't see any, any prohibiting factors, because we don't know, or, or even some unknown objects in the first place, uh, since we don't know how they are realized mechanically, so to speak, or biologically, so to speak. We don't know what their habitat would be, right? It might be anything, really. Uh, like, I can imagine easily, uh, let's say, supernovae as being acts of feeding of an alien. Let's say an alien 
came to a star and wanted to eat it, so it blew up. You, you know, kind of like when you bite a peach and it kind of squirts its juice, uh, something like that. Or, or it might be a birth of an alien from a star, actually. Maybe a star is an egg of an alien, you know, and it kind of hatched and it, all those pieces f flew in, in every direction. Like, I haven't seen anyone even think about that. I mean, it sounds kind of stupid on some level, but I mean, we observe supernovae, so why not? I mean, uh, okay, and um, I can imagine also, uh, let's say, beings that would just con consume energy from light, from stellar light, and matter from, again, stellar winds. Why not? I mean, it, it's it's an ab abundant source of energy and matter, so why not exist like that? Um, etc. etc. So the possibilities are really endless. Um, only if you think that earthly life is the only type of life possible, right? Uh, you would say that this is absurd. But I would say that to claim that only earthly life is possible and look for earth, for life on in other places this is really an absurd because well by definition like the, there's only one earth right so earthly life would only exist on earth so well of course that uh, people say well ah, maybe let's find a planet kind of like earth maybe life kind of like earthly life would exist there well maybe but uh, i don't know but wh why don't you try to generalize all that as what I'm doing right now, and and kind of try to figure out what life is in the first place, like what what is its basic properties. Uh, so, yeah, I would I would say that other types of life definitely pos are possible. Uh, there's plenty of energy in the universe. There's plenty of matter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So why limit ourselves with only searching the earthly type of life? I don't know. Uh, or we have, uh, and you know, the, there's this, uh, stupid idea that I encounter every now and then that, uh, again, it's speaking about this entropic principle that laws are perfectly fit for earthly life. So why is that? The question is, right? But uh, the problem is that it's a logical fallacy, in my opinion. It's again, the same entropic principle. Like, you don't know what kind of life would be there or here if we had different physical laws. It's just impossible to set up such an experiment. But my philosophical position, if you like, is such that if you change the physical laws, life would also change because our life didn't fell from the sky, didn't warped in from another universe. It was here from the very beginning. I mean, in the sense that it's, it's kind of its roots are in physics. So if you have a different root, I mean, a different soil, a different plant would grow there in some sense. You know, a different type of life might appear there. This is what I'm saying. So, uh, it's not that laws of physics are perfectly fit for humans. It's actually humans are perfectly fit for laws of physics, right? That's what I'm saying. Uh, uh, like, human behavior does not violate physics, basically. So, why should you assume that it's the physics that bends to the will of humans and not vice versa. Uh, it's kind of like this Darwinian tautology inside out, I guess. But anyway, so not only do we have stars with plenty of energy and other objects like that, we also have cosmic currents, you know, again, speaking about electric universe, plasma universe. Uh, we have like intergalactic currents, like millions of light years long, with plenty of matter, with plenty of energy. Uh, and, and here actually one might ask the question, well, is actually the plasma itself alive? It's a good question. Because, you know, the, the very term plasma was coined by Irving Langmuir because plasma resembled blood to him. Well, the idea was that in blood you have red and white blood cells and in plasma you have ions and electrons and kind of that was a similarity. But maybe it was like a prophetic, you know, uh, title. Maybe it actually is alive in some sense. At least cosmic plasmas, uh, they seem to be highly organized, etc., etc. So... Uh? I don't know.
uh, you might think about that. Uh, then I wanted to introduce here, uh, I wonder if the camera is still working, but anyway, probably not. Uh, then I want to introduce here this concept of what I call meta life, where it's just a abstract concept that I came up with while thinking about all those things. And uh, meta life is kind of like life of different lives, if, if, if you like, or different biospheres. So uh, you kind of consider each biosphere or maybe not a sphere, if it's not a spherical geometry, you know, if maybe, maybe biocylinder or something. But anyway, any biosphere as a sort of a meta-organism, right, or a cell, if you like, uh, and, and you have multiple cells, perhaps they are very different, perhaps they're realized on different physical and chemical and whatever principles, but you can, I think, Again, if you take my definition that life is just a repetition in time and multiplication in space, perhaps you can find many other types of life, uh, even if they would be not anything at all similar to our a animal life, let's say. Uh, or, but, but they would uh, fit into that definition. So they would be part of this meta-life. Our biosphere would be one cell in this meta-life, other biospheres would be other cells in this meta life, uh, etc. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting concept, in my opinion. And the same principles, I would say, would be applicable to every separate organism inside of this meta life. I mean, every, like, uh, indiv yeah, more or less every organism, where meta organism, you know, biosphere. So uh, the principles of, you know, what I talked about uh, with regards to entropy, space-time, uh, this Darwinian thing, which is also reproduced by my definition, etc. So, maybe it would be useful sometime in the future, I don't know. Uh, so, there might be also like a large-scale natural selection between various types of life, uh, various uh, meta-cells, so to speak, biospheres. Uh, okay, so another thing to note here is that if, like, the meaning of life, the meaning uh, is in this, basically, by definition, is in repetition and multiplication, uh, then, and we also consider that external conditions might vary, right? Uh, because that's how the world is, uh, we arrive at the ne necessity of adaptation, right? Life needs to adapt to changing conditions. So we have essentially two uh, objectives that contradict each other. Life needs to repeat in time, so it needs to conserve in some sense, but at the same time it needs to adapt to varying external conditions, so it needs to change. So you have to the need to conserve, to stay the same and to change at the same time, which contradict each other clearly. And if you look at my video about gender, you already know where I'm going with this. So I'll just briefly, like in a couple of sentences, describe what I mean by that. So that the uh, complex organisms uh, basically split their population in two to remove this contradiction, this fundamental contradiction of genetic code and life itself, more or less. Uh, so they remove this contradiction to societal level, so that one part of population sol solves, focuses on solving the problem of conservation, uh, and that's a female gender, and the other part of the population focuses on the adaptation, on change, and that's, that's the male part of the population. So that's how gender appears. And since it, it, it follows from just the very definition of life that I've given. Uh, we can conclude that aliens would also have either one gender, if they would be like relatively simple, if they would be able to solve both the conservation and adaptation tasks simultaneously, or they would have two genders if, if they would be too complex to, uh, so they would have to also split into two parts. But there's no third option, so either one gender or two genders. Okay, uh, in aliens, I mean. So you might consider this my prediction, if you like. Uh, and 
again, looking from like inside life, we cannot find its beginnings, right? I hope I was more or less I, I clear, clearly stated at least on philosophical level my position in, in this regard. Uh, so life sort of like existed forever. But the question might arise, well, can it end at some point? Uh, and of course, uh, you can you can uh, come up with some like extreme scenarios, uh, like you know the destruction, like shattering of Earth uh, into pieces, etc. So would life disappear in this case? Uh, well, my philosophical position, if you like, and like judging from everything that I know so far in terms of scientific data, etc., I would say no, definitely not. Life would not disappear. Whatever the heck you do with our planet, life is is gonna stay there i mean not not like literally stay there i mean life is not gonna be not gonna vanish something would survive definitely like you can d destroy the whole earth's crust like with nuclear weapons or something but you know what like 10 kilometers deep beneath the crust there's also life down there so how are you gonna destroy that that that's that would be pretty hard and if you shatter the whole planet into pieces, well, there, those would be some pieces, you know, so life would, would be still there. Or maybe it would fly away into space and, and, and bacteria would enter dormant mode and land, land onto the moon and somehow bury under the surface and, and, and live there, etc. So I don't really think you can destroy life, like honestly. Uh, that, that, that's almost impossible, I would say. Uh... Yeah, and at some point, I've actually thought about the possibility, again, returning to this whole discussion of no beginning of life and, and possibly no end even, uh, of conservation of life. Like, maybe there is, I'm, I'm not, like, talking really seriously, but on philosophical level, I'm very serious right now. Maybe there is, like, a law of conservation of life in some sense. So, life did not appear and therefore it wouldn't disappear you know in in that uh, sense at least so it's also a thing to think about and without extreme scenarios like like the destruction of the whole planet even more so life wouldn't disappear that like 100 percent guaranteed uh i can bet your money on that and reference myself uh if anything uh, because Paleontology, for example, shows us that uh, there have been multiple extinctions that like almost sterilized the whole planet, right? Yet look at the, this planet, it's, it's full of life, like despite all of those extinctions. <coughs> so, even more so, like paleontology tells us that about maybe 98, 98 percent of all the species that we know about are extinct species. So, in fact, you know, it's, it's actually more normal for a species to be extinct than to be alive. Uh, yet, the whole planet is like super rich in terms of life, still, despite all that. Uh, so, so it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. And so we should expect definitely most of today's species to go extinct, uh, I would say. And it's an absolutely normal situation, again, as paleontology tells us. And humans would also definitely die eventually, and it would be very natural. And uh, although it's uh, arguably it's another story. And again, if we're talking about intelligent life, uh, such as humans, Although, again, some people would argue it's not very intelligent. But uh, we'll talk about intelligence in the next video, in the final third video, uh, that hopefully is going to conclude this super long series. Uh, but so far, uh, I would wish to finish with a short uh, mentioning that, well, since I mentioned paleontology, uh, I, would, I, I would say that it's, a, it's actually quite a funny sort of like spin-off of biology and at some point I was thinking about the thing that I, I called eventually paleontological paradox where uh, paleontology as such uh, 
only shows us what did die out, right? So in some sense, it's showing us what is not typical for this planet, right? Because again, in Darwinian sense, it did die out. So it, it wasn't viable on some level. Uh, it didn't make it here. So it's a pretty interesting relation of, of biology and paleontology in this regard. <coughs> so you might say that paleontology has this statistical survival bias, right? It, it shows us, well, well, actually kind of like extinction bias rather, right? It shows us only dead things uh, that didn't make it, uh, right? And uh, probably we should take note of that, you know, and maybe we shouldn't make too, too many conclusions from paleontological data, again, returning to those extinctions, etc. Maybe they were just not viable. Maybe that was just, you know, a biological trash, a genetic trash, so to speak. Uh, again, what we can observe right now is that the, the whole planet is just filled with life. And, and I, I think it, it's going to be like that for many, many million years to come. But, yeah, that's probably a good, good way to end this video. So, thank you for watching, and in the last, like, 10 minutes listening, I guess, the eons are closing.